Welcome, friends, and thank you for joining our January 2024 edition of the Online Discussion Forum. I'm your host, C.L. Pierce, the Director of Admissions here at the RTS Jackson Campus uh, here in Mississippi. Uh, as always, Dr. Ligon Duncan, Jackson Campus President, CEO, and Chancellor of RTS, is here to lead our conversation. And joining him today is Dr. Guy Waters, RTS Jackson's Academic Dean and the James M. Baird Professor of New Testament. We're excited uh, to have Dr. Waters back with us uh, to discuss one of his latest projects, Word and Spirit, uh, Selected Writings in Biblical and Systematic Theology. This is a co-edited, or this was co-edited rather, with Dr. Uh, David Garner, and the book uh, pulls together some of Dr. Richard Gaffin's writings into one volume. So, uh, as always, we'll be giving away uh, a number of copies of Word and Spirit uh, for, for many participants on today's call. And then one winner is also going to receive a stack of related resources on the topic today. And I just the topic is Dr. Gaffin. So I just decided to get a bunch of Dr. Gaffin's books. Um, one of those being an introduction to the biblical theology of Acts and Paul in the fullness of time. Next up is a small little book, very helpful personally for me, um, Perspectives on Pentecost, New Testament Teaching on the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Following, we have Calvin uh, and the Sabbath, uh, the controversy of applying the fourth commandment. Next up is By Faith, Not By Sight, Paul in the Order of Salvation. And last but not least, uh, we also have Resurrection and Redemption, a study in Paul's soteriology. To enter the giveaway, just say hello in the chat. And as always, we leave the last half hour uh, for participation, uh, participant qu uh, questions, rather. If you would like to ask our con contributors a question, please use the Q&A feature next to the chat icon. Once you've clicked the Q&A icon, just type in your question and click send. That's all I have for announcements today, but for, before we get started, let's pray. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for those uh, who have gone before us who help us rightly divide the word of truth. I pray that uh, you would edify us and lead us into the truth uh, that has been deposited in your inerrant and life-giving word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Duncan, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, CL. Thank you for all that you do to set up these wonderful forum uh, calls. And we hope that this is edifying for everybody who participates today. It is CL said we're we're here to talk about Guy Waters' work on this volume and to talk about Dr. Gaffin, who uh, has been a friend to many of us. Uh, I, I was I was telling CL before the call, uh, Dr. Gaffin is just a lovely man, among other things. I, I love uh, Guy reading the, the the little testimony from his sons at the beginning of the book to what a good father he was and what a good husband he was. And uh, I was struck after H Howard Griffith, who taught theology for us at, at RTS DC and then passed away. At a, at a young age, uh, loved Dick Gaffin. I mean, just absolutely adored him. And uh, if you if you went into if you, if you went into Howard's office, you were going to hear about Dick Gaffin and Herman Bobbing sooner or later. Those two, those two things were going to come up in your conversation with Howard. And when Howard passed away, Dick's wife had just passed away a couple of weeks before. And, and Dick still made his way from Philadelphia to D.C. to be there at Howard's um, at Howard's funeral. And that was just that was the kind of man he was, a lovely is uh, a lovely, uh, a lovely Christian man. And um, so what a what a great opportunity to talk about the product of his theological work, his writings. And uh, I'd, I'd like to start off, Guy, just would, would you tell us how this came about? What was the. Where, where was the genesis of this particular project? Yeah, this project goes all the way back to 2012 
uh, Dave Garner, uh, Westminster Seminary, were, and I were serving on an assembly committee together, so we spend a lot of time with one another. And we, we both have mutual uh, fondness and appreciation for Dick Gaffin. And a couple of things were occurring to us even back then. One is that we were both teaching. We had been teaching for a while. And there was a generation of students who had never had classroom contact with Dick Gaffin. Uh, he had been retired for a number of years at that point. And we were concerned that a younger generation of Reformed students of Scripture would lose access. And then we also recognized that even as CL just held up for us a number of Dr. Gaffin's publications, some of his more important and influential publications were in journals, uh, they're mm -hmm. hard to find, um, and we were very much afraid that they were going to disappear and be lost in the sands of time. And so much in the spirit of what PNR did with the shorter writings of Gerhardus Voss and of B.B. Warfield, we wanted a compilation that would preserve and transmit these smaller writings so that later generations of readers would have access to them and still be able to benefit from the teaching ministry of Dick Gaffin. That's, that's great. And I, this is, by the way, it's from our friends at Westminster Seminary Press who have produced some lovely volumes uh, recently. Of course, they, uh, they, they had uh, the volume uh, on the anniversary of J. Gresham Machen's, uh, the 100th anniversary of the publication of Christianity and Liberalism. They, they produced a very nice volume that, interestingly, RTS professor Kevin DeYoung uh, introduced. And then this volume, uh, where uh, RTS professor and dean uh, Guy Waters, and Westminster Seminary graduate who knew uh, Dr. Gaffin and studied <clears throat> with him well. And by the way, it just points to the wonderful relationships that we have with so many of our friends at Westminster Seminary. Uh, Westminster Seminary has been a friend to RTS from the very beginning. Uh, Dr. Clowney came uh, to speak at the first convocation uh, for, uh, or the first commencement for RTS and uh, Westminster Seminary has uh, been a close partner to us over the years. So it's nice to have RTS professors uh, working alongside of uh, Dave Garner and uh, producing this volume. Give, give us a, a quick overview of the, the layout, the contents, the structure of Word and Spirit Selected Writings in Biblical and Systematic Theology. Right. And and that may defy belief when you see how big this volume is that these are selected writings. But we yeah, really and that, you know, just I mean, there's just the first page of the table of content. <laughs> right. Um well Dave and I made the decision and we're very glad we did. We wanted to involve Dr. Gaffin on the ground floor. So his fingerprints are on both the arrangement and contents of this book. There were a number of pieces that he lightly revised uh, for republication in this volume, and we're very grateful that, so that it would be a fitting tribute and testimony to his work. Uh, part of the challenge is that Dr. Gaffin has um, 60 or 70 years of publications behind his belt. Uh, the first piece in this volume appeared in the Westminster Journal in 1968. And the most recent piece was within the last year or two. So wow. we had to look at his corpus. And as with any writer, th there are certain uh, themes, there, there's overlap. And so we didn't think that these pieces were repetitive. We thought the overlap was constructive. And so we wanted the divisions in this book to reflect that and to help the reader. So you're going to find pieces on the Holy Spirit grouped together. You're going to find pieces on the theology of Paul grouped together. You're going to find pieces on union with Christ and justification grouped together. We opted in the end for a topical ordering. We thought that would best reflect uh, Dr. Gaffin's work and would be most helpful to the reader. So if you turn to the table of contents, uh, you'll see that we uh, begin with uh, pieces dealing with the, the interpretation of scripture, biblical and systematic theology. We then go to pieces on Paul and Hebrews, then the doctrine of scripture, something Dr. Gaffin has been 
very concerned uh, to explain and defend across his ministry, uh, the person and work of the Holy Spirit, and then the doctrine of salvation. And that gives a nice overview of Dr. Gaffin's work, and it maps well on the topics of systematic theology. And uh, Guy, what were some of the formative events and people and mm -hmm. institutions that shaped Dr. Gaffin's academic pursuits and ministry? Yes. Well, you certainly have to start with Westminster Seminary and Professor John Murray had a tremendous influence upon him and, and he acknowledges that debt. But of course, Westminster is the heir of Old Princeton and coming out of Old Princeton, both B.B. Warfield and Gerhardus Voss, particularly Voss, have had a tremendous influence on his thought. Westminster has really two streams of influence historically. There is American Presbyterianism through Princeton Seminary, and there's the Dutch Reformed tradition, particularly in the vein of Herman Bovink and Abraham Kuyper. And so uh, Dr. Gaffin is fluent in Dutch, is conversant with uh, Dutch theological literature, and you're seeing those two streams coming together early on in his work. As you trace his academic ministry, you'll see in the 1970s, he is addressing the questions coming out of the charismatic movement, and you have a firm but winsome defense of the reform doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and we have pieces reflecting that here. Uh, the controversy surrounding the doctrine of Scripture, uh, beginning with Rogers and McKim, but extending through the 80s and the 90s, he's addressing those. And then it when you get into the 90s and to the aughts, as the controversy surrounding the new perspective begin to surface, he writes more and more on union with Christ, justification, sanctification, and you have a number of most helpful pieces addressing those issues uh, from that period of time. So Dr. Gaffin is a churchman, and he has sought to place himself before the issues that were concerning the church and to serve the church where she needed it, not where he thought it needed help. Uh, Guy, you, like a number of other RTS professors, Bob Kara, et cetera, have been invited to lecture at uh, Westminster Seminary from time to time and have been happy to help our friends out there. Let's say that you're having a conversation with a Westminster Seminary student or a Reform Seminary student that never took Dr. Gaffin for anything, is just beginning to read uh, some here and there in Dr. Gaffin's writings. What, what would be Guy Waters' list uh, or some of Guy Waters' things on your list of the most important contributions of Dr. Gaffin? Hmm. Well, I would say as, as an introduction, by a point of introduction, take the time to work through In the Fullness of Time, which Crossway mm -hmm. has recently put out. These are essentially his lectures on Acts and Paul prepared for publication, which he has taught to generations of students now. And I think there you'll get the best introduction of the, the piety and theology of Dick Gaffin. Mm. And le let me say, these were published last year. Dr. Gaffin is turning 88 in July, and he is not slowing down. I'll, I can tell you a story about that in a moment. <clears throat> so that is, that's where I would start. But I would say in this volume, two pieces that have been uh, especially helpful. Uh, the first is the very last piece, uh, Theonomy and Eschatology, Reflections on Postmillennialism. Uh, he wrote this with other members of Westminster Seminary in a volume that was responding to Greg Bonson and Theonomy in the late 80s, early 90s. As I reread this piece with all of the discussions around Christian nationalism, church, state, politics. I'm struck how timely this piece is, even though it was written 35 years ago. Wow. Another piece that I would recommend uh, is a piece that he wrote on the cross. I'm just wanting to get the 
the exact title. It's the usefulness of the cross, where he works through mm -hmm. a number of passages like Philippians 2 and 2 Corinthians 3. And <clears throat> he is he is rightly defending penal substitutionary atonement. But he goes on to say, in upholding that, we also recognize that Christ came to be an example. It's not an either or, it's a both and. Mm -hmm. And he, he has wonderful meditations on suffering in union with Christ and the Christian life. And of course, as you alluded just a moment ago, Dr. Gaffin has lived his creed. His yeah, has not been he really has. Life. And for his students, part of the... Um, the, the delight about being around Dr. Gaffin is that what he is in his writings, he is in life. He is, his mm -hmm. theology and life mirror one another so well. Right. And his sons in the, in, in I, I don't know what it's called, but yes, I guess it's called, a, no, it's called the for, the forward because there's a forward and there's an introduction that you and Dave Garner did. And then there's a note on text. So there, there are a lot of preface materials uh, before you get into the writings. In their foreword, they comment about his patience and his his just his Christian demeanor and character quite beautifully. It's, you know, every dad hopes that you've lived in such a way that your that your children can say true things about you that are complimentary of your Christian character and, and how lovely to have his sons give that kind of a testimony to him. Uh, Guy, you uh, ha probably had a special responsibility for certain pieces in this volume. So could you like walk us through a couple of the things that you were responsible for editing and give us some highlights or point us to some pastoral theological significance or whatever you want to do uh, as you walk us through something that you had a special responsibility for editing? Absolutely. Well, uh, <clears throat> one of, thankfully, Dave and I saw eye to eye. So when I advocated for something, I didn't have to do it long. I didn't have to do it over protests. But one of the pieces that I really wanted to see included, uh, his recent pub writings on theistic evolution, particularly mm -hmm. responding to Pete Enns. And I think that's one of the hard principled things that Dr. Gaffin did in, in the controversies within Westminster Seminary is to give a clear statement on the doctrine of scripture in relation to the historicity of Adam. And his uh, it was published as a booklet initially, No Adam, No Gospel. Mm -hmm. it's, it's clear, it's powerful, it's, it's winning. And I'm very glad that there was no objection to that being in the volume. Yeah. Uh, I would also say in a different vein, his pieces on the Holy Spirit, particularly coming out of the controversies, the charismatic controversies in the 70s and 80s, uh, they are not mere pieces of polemicism, though they're polemics at its very best, but he's wanting to show constructively the ongoing ministry of the Spirit in the life of the believer. Uh, this is something as Reformed people we don't shy away from, we don't yield to other quarters in the Christian church, but we uphold the person and work of the, the Holy Spirit without apology. And he shows how within our theology, we can rightly prize and stress the ministry of the Spirit in the life of the Christian. So these were pieces that I'm, I'm very right. glad were included. I, I was I was particularly happy to see both the piece on No Adam, No Gospel, but also the the, his translator's preface to Adam in the New Testament yes. uh, included in, in the volume. And I do think that's timely. And I actually think that it represents the, a, a shift that we've seen uh, on the Westminster faculty. You have on the Westminster faculty today uh, people teaching Old Testament uh, who uh, have no truck uh, with theistic evolution. Uh, and I think it's a it's a it's a reflect uh, it's a reflection of an emphasis. I don't think the early Westminster had to worry about those things because of the theological position that Westminster occupied, and because of where the OPC and the uh, other conservative denominations were. And then suddenly we entered into a world in the 1980s and following that was very very different. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I I think Dr. Gaffin's clear. The, the note that he sounded 
uh, on that is is reflected when you when you talk to Ian Duguid or Johnny Gibson or or those guys at Old Testament. There's there's no quarter for a, for a theistic evolution, uh, and and that's good. That's a, that's an RTS emphasis uh, mm -hmm. as well. And so I uh, was very thankful for that. Guy, you studied with Dr. Gaffin. You know Dr. Gaffin. Talk to us a little bit about ways that his life and teaching shaped your own life and ministry. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing that I would stress is I, I think I learned as much from Dr. Gaffin watching him field questions in the classroom mm -hmm. as I did receiving his lecture material that he had prepared for us. You know, Westminster students could be a rough and tumble bunch. <laughs> Some of those questions were not the friendliest, and he invariably handled them with grace and poise. And so he modeled to me, when people are coming hard at you in the church, here's how you respond. Here's what you say. Here's how you say it. Here's the demeanor you bring to that exchange. And that's, that's a lesson that I'm never going to forget. I think I also took away the fact that, that Dr. Gaffin was first and foremost, is first and foremost, he's a churchman. He's involved in the courts of the church. He publishes for the church. He's active in committee work for the church. Many of his writings in this book were initially done for the church. He doesn't see, and, and this is something we value at RTS, we don't see scholarship, we don't see church service as alternatives. We see them as married in the life and ministry of our faculty. And I needed to have that modeled to me, and he modeled to that to me so well. And so I, I can go back to a living example. What, what does scholarship for the church look like? And I can think of Dr. Gavin. Mm -hmm. and, and Guy, let me tell you, those, those lessons have definitely come through uh, in your own uh, life and ministry, as I have been able to be privileged to observe it. I've, I've watched you in the context of theological controversy articulate a sound commitment to the scriptures and to reform theology without a hint of animus uh, and with a, uh, a, a spirit of humility, uh, but with a clarity and a persuasiveness uh, in, and I've seen you both in, in delivering material, but also in answering questions, kind of even in the whirlwind. And, you know, sometimes it's that way, both in an academic setting or a polemical setting or an ecclesiastical setting. And you, you modeled that. I'm sure Dr. Gaffin would be proud of you. Yeah. And uh, so uh, well, well done. And, and you're a churchman like he is uh, as well. You have uh, always participated in uh, the local church, presbytery and the life of the general assembly of the church. So you're, you're a good representative of those emphases that you just mentioned. Um, okay, let, let's say we've got somebody on the call today that has never read any Gaffin. Mm -hmm. You already said that the Acts volume is really good, but if you were going to start with a beginner, where would you tell the beginner to start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say if if you've had no introduction to, to Dr. Gaffin at all, and you, you just want to get your feet wet, uh, there's a it's in fact, it's the first piece in this volume. This was uh, came from a five views uh, intervarsity volume that Stan Porter uh, and one of his students co-edited uh, different views of interpreting scripture. And so he was assigned the redemptive historical view. And so if you you just want a flavor of how do I come to Scripture and interpret it? What does it mean that Christ is the center of Scripture? What is a Christ-centered reading of Scripture? And what does that look like? Uh, in a, if you want that in brief and accessible compass, I think that's the place to go. In many ways, that's the front door to his whole work. That's part of the reason we put that article in, in first place. That's good. Uh, questions are already coming in from our participants, and folks, feel free uh, to make sure and put that in the Q&A or send it to, uh, to CL, and he'll get them to me. But I want to start asking questions from our participants, Guy, and the first one is a good one. Uh, from the perspective of someone, uh, this person says, like me, who hasn't read the book, how does Dr. Gaffin explain and or distinguish the ordo salutis 
in relation to the Historia Salutis? And maybe explain those terms for everybody, uh, Guy, as you answer that question. All right. No, great question. So Historia Salutis is a Latin phrase, meaning history of salvation, Ordo Salutis, a Latin phrase, meaning order of salvation. And those two phrases basically, and we could qualify this some, but they basically map on to what we sometimes call redemption accomplished and redemption applied. So what is it that God has done once for all to save the believer in Christ? And then how are we, are we to think of the application of that redemption by the Spirit's ministry in time to the individual believer. That's really what Historia Salutis and Ordo Salutis are getting at. And he, here is where, and these pieces, I think, will be remarkably useful in this regard. Uh, so many problems and errors in theology come because we're not relating these two together in the right way. And that's what Dr. Gaffin, I think, very helpfully drawing from deep theological wells, Calvin, Bobbing, Warfield, to help us to see the <clears throat> centrality of the Astoria Salutis. We, uh, we begin with redemption accomplished, and what is applied to us is what first has been accomplished in Christ, and working that out in detail and in the context of various passages. So I think he's a, he's a sure-footed guide on that point, and will save us from a heap of trouble if we attend carefully to what he says. Are there particular pieces that you would recommend in, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at a table of contents and thinking, okay, well, you know, you've just given this answer to a young man, where would you, where would you say in this volume or somewhere, somewhere else in, uh, in Dr. Gaffin's writings, would you point someone who wanted to read on that? And because that's been, that's kind of one of his things, mm -hmm. his Historia Salutis, Ordo Salutis. So where would you point them to start reading on that? I might look at the opening pieces in part five, the work of Christ applied for us and for our salvation, Calvin's soteriology, and then union with Christ. Uh, and Dr. Gaffin has long emphasized union with Christ because in, in many ways, it's the nexus of redemption accomplished, redemption applied. Right. And understanding that nexus, I think, opens up both and helps us to understand our own salvation. So 31, 32, 33 in the table of contents, I might start there. That's very helpful. And and then at, in terms of one of the books that uh, we're giving away, I think one of them is By Faith, Not By Sight, where he's thinking about this in relation to answering N.T. Wright and the new perspectives on Paul. And I think that controversy actually allowed Dick to sharpen certain things that he wanted to. I mean, do you feel that way, Guy, looking at that material? I agree. And <clears throat> I think one of the benefits, William Cunningham pointed this out in the 19th century, as lamentable as um, error and controversy are in the church, one of the things they do is they serve to sharpen us so that we achieve a level of precision that we didn't have before. And I think when you look at Dr. Gaffin, the, the new perspective was the occasion for some sharp and precise reflection, particularly on justification by faith alone. And that's been a gift to the church, uh, those yeah. writings in the, from the late 90s into the aughts. That's good. Um, and another question, uh, another really good question that has come in is, what kinds of lessons should contemporary preaching and systematic theology learn and take forward from Dr. Gaffin and from Professor Murray before him. So think a little bit about preaching and systematic theology and, and share with this guy what you think some of the lessons we ought to learn. Right. Well, one of the things that I appreciate, and, and this I think becomes more pronounced and clearer as you track through his, his writing ministry, is that the, the sometimes posed antithesis between biblical theology on the one hand and systematic theology is no real antithesis. 
Yes. These, these are friends. These are not enemies. That's right. One of the best things that Dr. Gaffin does, both by teaching, but also by modeling in his exegesis, is to show you can do the best biblical theology while uh, drawing from the best of the church's systematic theological yes. reflection. Yes. And just to witness that, I think, is an achievement in itself. That, by the way, I, I just posted this morning Gerhardus Voss's comments about that, which he makes in the preface of biblical theology. And Voss, of course, had such a profound impact on both Professor Murray and on Dick Gaffin. And um, uh, Voss says, biblical theology occupies a position between exegesis and systematic theology in the encyclopedia of theological disciplines. It differs from systematic theology, not in being more biblical or adhering more closely to the truths of scriptures, but in that its principle of organizing the biblical material is historical rather than logical. And I, I, I so wish, I mean, Voss is virtually the father of biblical theology in our theological neck of the woods. I wish more people that did biblical theology would listen to Professor Voss, <laughs> Professor Voss in that uh, area. And of course, it was certainly one of Dick's missions to help us correctly relate biblical and systematic theology and to uh, to realize the fruits of both. I, I often tell people uh, who only are interested in a redemptive historical approach uh, and who will champion Voss, I'll point out Dick Gaffin, translated Voss on dogmatic theology. So Voss's dogmatic theology, his reform systematic theology was translated by Dr. Gaffin. And so Voss himself appreciated the importance of both a redemptive historical and a dogmatic approach or a biblical theological and a uh, systematic theological approach. So that's a, that's, a, that's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Okay, here's another one. Uh, and this is this is actually a really good question. The the volume that um, C. L. held up on Calvin and the Sabbath reflects a longtime uh, interest of uh, Dr. Gaffin in the doctrine of the Sabbath. Doctor Doctor Gaffin had a high view of the Lord's Day, and uh, very often Calvin is appealed to as not having a high view of the Lord's Day. And so this question is. What was the context and rationale of Dr. Gaffin's book on Calvin and the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. the, the brief answer, that was his THM thesis at Westminster Seminary. And uh, if, if you have read his Resurrection and Redemption, that was a revised form of his dissertation, his doctoral dissertation. So put those two together, Calvin and the Sabbath, THM, Resurrection and Redemption, PhD, there's the rest of his life. You have mm. historical theology and you have uh, biblical theology. And that book, Calvin and the Sabbath, is published, I think, by our friends at Christian Focus Publications in their mentor series, which is their academic imprint. Am I right about that? I can't, I can't remember. Right. I don't have it. I, I don't have that nice stack of books that CL uh, has close to hand, but uh, you, that's a volume. Correct, right. You can't see me. It is. It is. A, okay, good. Series. Yeah, and it's a it's it's a nicer binding than the one I have. I my, mine is not not nearly so handsome as that uh, binding. Mm -hmm. So the winner of the books today will have a nicer looking copy uh, than I do of that. Okay, here's another good question that's come in, um, Guy. You mentioned the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. What is Dr. Gaffin's understanding of the Pentecost and the work of the Spirit in the Christian life? Right. So it, I, I wish we had a whole forum to talk through this, but I'll, I'll just give a sliver and then invite uh, viewers to read the book or to read his book, Perspectives on Pentecost. Dr. Gaffin's starting point is that uh, Pentecost uh, belongs to Astoria Salutis, not Ordo Salutis. So it's among the once for all works of Christ for redemption to be ranked among his death, resurrection, and ascension. It reflects the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in fullness upon all nations. 
upon the completion of his redemptive work in history. So we should not think about Pentecost in the first instance as some kind of ongoing experience in the life of the believer. That, that's going to miss what Pentecost is really about. Now, what Dr. Gaffin goes on to do is to say that has profound implications for the Christian life. And to give an example, he, uh, in a number of places in this book, addresses places where, for instance, Paul tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, looking, for instance, at that command in Ephesians 5, he, parallel, he looks at the parallel in Colossians. What Those are parallel passages. What's the parallel of be filled with the Holy Spirit? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then look at the way Paul develops his argument after the command to be filled with the Spirit. These all involve commands of um, <clears throat> loving those in our home, loving those in the church, uh, loving those who are outside the church. So it, it's to live a life in accordance with the word in the context of the callings where Christ has set us. Uh, Dr. Gaffin's going to express that so much better than I can in just a few seconds. But what I appreciate is that he's stressing, on the one hand, the once-for-allness of Pentecost. On the other hand, the way in which this has ongoing implications, applications for the life of the Christian. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's good. Thank you, Guy. Okay, another really good question. Mm -hmm. Wh who would you say has been the greatest influence on Dr. Gaffin's theology from the past? Now, you've already hinted at Murray, you've already hinted at, at Voss, so you may want to double down on that and, and, and talk about that. And then, and then he points forward. And who, besides yourself, is carrying forward his legacy today? Mm -hmm. Boy. Well, I think in, in latter years, I have noticed in Dr. Gaffin's writing, uh, particularly a explicit appreciation for Herman Bovink. I think mm -hmm. that's always been there. Uh, remember, Bovink has uh, only been available in translation to most of us for the last 10, 15 years or so, except for some excerpts. Uh, Dr. Gaffin has been reading Herman Bovink in the Dutch for for decades now. And uh, you you just see the influence of Bobbing on his thought. Um, so I, I think we we oughtn't underestimate Herman Bobbing. And I think looking forward, uh, if if I can give a collective answer, I, I would, as, as you were pointing out a moment ago, Lagan, point to multiple members of the faculty of RTS who have studied mm -hmm. under Dr. Gaffin mm -hmm. and who are carrying that ethos forward in this institution. It, it would be hard for me to point to one person yeah. because he has trained so many and so yeah. many bear that mantle as, as best we're able. And I think you best see his influence really in a legion of people rather yeah. than a single person. Yeah, well said. Um, here, here's another um, here's another good question. Is there any principle or teaching that uh, the older Gaffin is emphasizing in these days that he would wish to pass along to the next generation of biblical scholars and pastors? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Um, I think as you as you look at the trajectory of his life and writings, uh, you don't really see something pop to the surface that was completely absent at another period of time. There's uh, there's an organic connection among his his emphases and concerns. But I think and and part of this is relating to controversies in which he found himself um, in in latter years. But you do see the the earnestness with which he applies himself. It shows heartfelt conviction. Really, the, the two principles we identify with the Protestant Reformation, the doctrine of scripture on the one hand and justification by faith yep. alone on the other yep. hand. And I think to the degree that he's concerned in the uh, closing years of his writing ministry to pass something down to this generation, I, I would point to those two. Yeah. And and let me say, uh, you know, 
I, I don't think anybody would question uh, how good a friend, for instance, to Norman Shepard Dick was. Dick loved Norman, uh, but it, it you know in the end, uh, Dick, with all his graciousness, wanted to articulate very clearly where he thought Norman had gone astray mm -hmm. uh, on on that doctrine, and you you appreciate that both that personal and relational love and affection, but that determination to be faithful to the truth no matter what and same same thing as you say when it comes to the doctrine of scripture and the the the, the historical person of adam as specially created by god uh body and soul and not some sort of an, a hominid uh adopted uh by mm -hmm. god out of a out of a group of other hominids etc you know dr gaffin has spoken uh, generously, but faithfully and clearly to those kinds of, of questions in our own time. Okay, here's another question that has uh, come in. Uh, I appreciate, this person says, I appreciate both Voss and Gaffin's commitment to not pitting biblical and systematic theology against each other, as some do. How can they mutually inform each other as theological disciplines? So you're teaching a class, and in light of what you've learned from Dr. Gaffin, how would you say that systematic and biblical theology mutually inform one another as theological disciplines? Right. Well, I, I might begin with that fantastic quote from Voss that she shared <laughs> with us and you sent out this morning. I think just recognizing that these, these are compatible but different disciplines— but, and also recognizing that biblical theology is in service of systematic theology, uh, not, not the other way around. I mean, we conduct our biblical theolog theology systematically, of course, and we, un we do our uh, systematic theology always with biblical theology in mind. But uh, there's, a, there's a progression. We're going somewhere, and where we're going in biblical theology is uh, systematic theology and, and ultimately its application to the life of the church. And I think looking at uh, places like the first piece that I mentioned a moment ago, the redemptive historical view of scripture, will map uh, a, a more theoretical approach, but just watching it uh, instantiate in specific passages, specific issues in, in this volume, I think that's going to be the most helpful way to see how these two interrelate in a compatible and constructive fashion. Yeah. And, and uh, by the way, to drill down into some specific examples of this, uh, it's been my privilege and, privilege and responsibility to teach reform uh, covenant theology at Reformed Theological Seminary for the last 34 years. And a number of years ago, uh, a friend of mine, John Piper, asked a question about a text Galatians 3.14, he asked a really good question. How, how come Paul relates the pouring out of the Spirit to the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant when there is no material in Genesis, in the Abraham cycle from Genesis 12 following, in which the Spirit is <laughs> indicated as part of the blessing of Abraham? And I gave I gave John a a vaguely correct answer to that question, based on sort of my hunch. And my my hunch was that the prophets, especially Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the the later Old Testament prophets, had seen the promises of the pouring out of the Spirit uh, as the way that God would bring about the fulfillment of the Abrahamic blessing, especially that blessing going to the nations. Well, if you know John, John Piper, John does not like vague answers. And so my vague answer was entirely, entirely, uh, uh, you know, un unhelpful to him from his perspective. He wants specificity. Well, <clears throat> at the faculty retreat in Atlanta, I got to sit down and have uh, lunch with Greg Beal, uh, a world-class uh, uh, biblical theologian himself, a colleague of ours on the RTS faculty, and a former colleague to Dr. Gaffin on the Westminster Seminary faculty. And I asked Greg the same question, and he immediately knew to go to Isaiah 44 and about 10 other places. Mm -hmm. 
in the prophetic literature where that connection was explicitly made by the uh, the, the the later prophets uh, of the Old Testament to the Abrahamic covenant, the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And <clears throat> that illustrated to me, you know, Greg's, Greg's got his eyes on two things all the time. One, exegetical interrelations and allusions between texts of scripture, Old Testament and Old Testament, New Testament and Old Testament. And then he's got his eyes on biblical theology. Well, that that helped me do a better job as a systematic theologian in answering a good question about a text. And so there you really see what Voss uh, says in that quote, exegetical theology, biblical theology, and systematic theology all working together. That's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, we, we're more biblical when we do all three of those in relation to one another well. And Dr. Gaffin was such a good example of that, as are you, because uh, do, uh, Dr. Waters not only teaches New Testament, he also teaches systematic theology uh, at Reformed Theological Seminary, like Dr. Gaffin did. Dr. Gaffin, once upon a time, uh, was a New Testament theologian who transitioned into systematic theology. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I, the, the, the more uh, exegetical and, and redemptive historical and dogmatic or topical or systematic we can be in conversation, I think the better for our exposition, the better for uh, the church, the better for our application, frankly, uh, of the scriptural text. So uh, great, great answer. And I'm going to ask you a question right in your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great one that has come in. How does Dr. Gaffin deal with N.T. Wright's arguments on the new perspective on Paul. Many people will know that uh, Dr. Gaffin actually debated uh, N.T. Wright uh, a number of years ago in Louisiana. I bet Dr. Waters has listened to those lectures. Faith, uh, uh, not by faith, but uh, not by sight, but by faith, uh, by faith, not by sight, came out of that uh, interchange. Walk us through that. How does Dr. Gaffin respond to N.T. Wright and the new perspectives on Paul. Yeah. Well, Dr. Gaffin was one of the early, earlier reform voices to express concern about N.T. Wright in print. And <clears throat> it's a little confusing because there are two pieces with about the same title in this book. They were published 32 years apart. You want to look for Paul the Theologian from 2000. That's his review article of N.T. Wright, and particularly his What St. Paul Really Said. And that's where Dr. Gaffin incisively begins to raise questions, looking under the hood of Wright's work about justification, imputation, righteousness for justification, and, and does so not just exegetically, but theologically as well. It's, it's a programmatic piece, meaning he, he doesn't have time or leisure to write a 200-page book on this, but he says as much in 15 pages as others would take 500 pages to say. Mm -hmm. And so if you want an acquaintance with not just what did Dr. Gaffin think, but what are the concerns with N.T. Wright's approach to Paul, that's the place to start. I think that piece remains uh, fresh and vibrant and important today as it did 24 years ago. That's that's chapter 14 in the book. It's in the second section called The Theology of Hebrews and Paul. And again, the title is Paul the Theologian, colon, a review essay, not to be confused with the next article, which has almost the same title, but not quite. So it's chapter 14 in uh, word and spirit, and it it was written early on in uh, as as people began to assess uh, N.T. Wright. By the way, I would say uh, that one one thing I tell my students is false juxtapositions, that is opposing two things to one another that are not really opposed. False juxtapositions are the bane of good theology. Mm -hmm. And N.T. Wright is the poster child for <laughs> false juxtapositions. And uh, he will say things that actually could be really helpful if they were not opposed to something else 
but he will oppose them to something else. Mm -hmm. And, and then it will become completely unhelpful. And, uh, and, and, Pro and Professor Gaffin, uh, I think you're right, uh, recognized some of those problems mm -hmm. early on. Uh, Guy, here's another question. Um, this person says, I had Dr. Gaffin for introduction to systematic theology in the early 2000s. Has the material from those lectures been put into a book form or can it be found anywhere in his writings? I think to that extent, not that I'm aware. Um, one thing I did, I uh, took as thorough notes as I could as a seminary student at Westminster. I went to Kinko's back in the mid 90s and spiral bound my notes and they are preserved. Product placement. <laughs> <laughs> um, if Kinko's even exists anymore. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so I, I think that there may be some underground network or former students sharing these things on the dark yeah. web. I don't know. Yeah. But to my knowledge, it's not been put in print. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gaffin certainly has the energy and stamina to do it. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell my story now. I led a seminar of students in Romans 9 to 16. We got to Romans 11. Long story, but the seed was planted. I thought... <clears throat> Herman Ritterboss, his commentary on Romans has never been translated from the Dutch, and he's got some really interesting stuff in his exposition of Romans 11. So I translated the relevant portion, and I finished, and I thought, what have I done? What am I going to do with this? And I thought, I'm going to talk to Dr. Gaffin, because he, he knows this material so well, but I, I don't want to press him, because I know he's got a lot of going on. So I'll just take a few sentences and see if he could look them over and uh, correct them for me. Well, I wrote him and he said, just send me the whole thing, this 5,000 word translation. I'll look it over. I said, well, great. I'll send you the, the photocopy of Ritterboss on Romans in Dutch. He said, don't worry about it. I've got it here on my shelf in the nursing home, 86 years old. And he went over that with a fine tooth comb. He has not slowed down a bit. And um, he, he has done some other work on Ritterboss and, and he has graciously agreed, we're gonna bundle that together. It's gonna be published in a journal, uh, 88 years old. So wow. uh, he has stumbled on the fountain of youth at Westminster Seminary. I just hope that I stumbled on it when I was a student there as well. Absolutely true. I think James Ritchie had asked you a question. How can we get him to keep writing? I think you've already answered the question. Uh, uh, Dr. Gaffin is still very, very productive there at the yeah. at the nursing home. Uh, here's a, here's another uh, question that has come in. What advice do you think Dr. Gaffin would give to younger pastors today who are navigating various controversial cultural issues? that directly affect members of our congregations and communities? Great question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, Dr. Gaffin, as we've stressed, he's, he's a man of the church and for the church. So these concerns sit very much on his heart. But he would stress in the first instance, and this is a line that appears in the volume that we would hear him say uh, in the classroom, that theology is radically non-speculative, meaning we, we go to the scripture, we don't go beyond that which is written. And so our task as those who are called to teach and preach in the word is to bring the word of God to people. Hold back nothing that God has said, but add nothing to it. And I think there's great pressure from both directions on ministers to, to speak to things that we really oughtn't speak to, but also to trim our sails when we need to speak to issues that need speaking to from the word of God. So I think that would be his, his clarion call is hold fast the word, don't let it go, preach all of it, don't hold back. You know, I'm, I'm reminded our friend and colleague, Mike Campbell, who used to be the pastor of Redeemer uh, Presbyterian Church here in Jackson, which is a, a wonderful multi-ethnic congregation, uh, was approached 
I, I think in the context of the either the Baltimore riots or the Ferguson riots many years ago by a young man who said, um, how are you going to address this particular cultural uh, situation in your preaching? Uh, on Sunday. And Mike, who's a fine expositor at that time, was preaching through the Gospel of John. And he said, well, I was in John 5 last Sunday. I plan to be in John 6 this Sunday. And I, I, I you know, this is a this is a person ministering to a congregation uh, far from disinterested in those things. But he wanted to make sure that God was having the work with his people from the text of Scripture, not Mike's ideas about how, you know, how we ought to do this, that, or the other. I thought that was, that was a pretty brave thing for Mike to say. Uh, and uh, of course, Mike is ministering in, in Miami, Florida now very effectively uh, for the Lord. That's along the lines of what you've just uh, reminded us. Uh, we're, we're up there to give not our own opinions, but the word of the Lord. If the Lord has given us a word to speak, we speak it. If he hasn't, we don't. That's a good, that's a good word. Here's another question that came in guy, and that is, what concerns did Dr. Gaffin have regarding the future teaching at seminaries? Hmm. Well, I think much of the last quarter century of Dr. Gaffin's uh, ministry was invested in Westminster Seminary, particularly with some of the very significant concerns that were surfacing from faculty members. And one thing that you see surfacing in his responses is that seminaries have to be confessionally faithful. We can't deviate from what we have told the church. We are committed to teach and preach. And so that I think it's less articulated than assumed and informing his work is that seminaries need to be faithful to the Westminster standards that they embrace. And we, sim we simply cannot tolerate uh, deviation from the Westminster standards if, if we're to do what we're called to do. So I, th I think that would be his word for seminaries today, re remain faithful to the confessional standards. Uh, that's the way you're best going to serve uh, the church and Christ. We have been talking to Dr. Guy Prentice Waters, uh, Dean and Professor of New Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, about a volume that he co-edited with uh, our dear friend Dave Garner of Westminster Seminary. It's published by Westminster Seminary Press. It's called Word and Spirit. It's selected shorter writings of Dick Gaffin. By the way, on page uh, 727 in this volume, there's a lovely short biography of mm -hmm. Dr. Gaffin by our friend Danny Olinger, who is uh, a, a wonderful brother who's edited the New Horizons magazine involved in theological education in the OPC. And one of the interesting stories he says, uh, Dr. Gaffin was born in China to Presbyterian missionaries and may be the first covenant child born in what is now the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. He was born something like 20 something days after what was then called the Presbyterian Church of America, and then later became known as the Orthodox Presbyterian Church was formed. Really, really wonderful little biography. Guy, thank you so much to, uh, for, for being with us today. And I'll hand it back over to C.L. Pierce to tell us about our next online forum. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Waters, for being with us today. Uh, personally, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, okay, so next online discussion forum coming up in February. We've got Dr. Glad back with us today, or rather uh, next month, and um, uh, talking about one of his uh, many pr productions, this Dictionary of the New Testament's Use of the Old Testament that he co-edited with Dr. Beal, D.A. Carson, and Andrew Nicelli. Um, that'll be February 15th. That's a Thursday uh, at noon. We look forward to having you back. Thanks for being with us today, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for being along. It's always a joy to see you. Mm -hmm. God bless.